along the front door. Find a seat, find a seat. Find a seat, sit down. Shut up. Okay, we have twenty-five dollars to the winner. So we need someone to pick. Who's gonna pick? Who's gonna pick? Them Dr. Pepper is four dollars a dozen. You two can have delicious, real farm eggs. And believe me, if you've never had a farm egg, it's nothing like the flavor of, of the stuff we buy in the supermarket. So, just to let you know, John does sell them. So put in your order. I have, and I got mine. So, how was that for Thank you. I'll give you a Eccentric collector, and every once in a while, I, I mean, I realize anyone's wife here would say, <laughs> but uh, but I could give some examples. The first time uh, I went out to his house, and it's usually when he's got something else that he's interested in. Now he's into steam engines and things that um, he'll call me up with something he wants to sell to raise money for something else. First time I went there, it's a big old uh, house, goes back to Civil War times, I guess. And uh, went in the living room, he was showing me some really neat stuff, but he apologized, there's no place to sit down, and every couch and chair is filled with x-ray tubes. <laughs> and you can't sit on those. So we just stood up, looked around, went down his basement where he has things like a, an Edison long-waisted Marianne. Uh, he's got incredible motors and things that he's restored. And um, we go back, buy a couple things, come back a year later, looking around the living room, he says, I apologize, there's no place to sit down, I just got all these x-ray tubes. <laughs> so uh, the x-ray tubes stayed there for a good number of years. But some of the things that I've gotten, uh, and anyone who's been to the house has seen what we call Sparky, it's a big uh, electrotherapy machine from 1901 
That's really about the size of two refrigerators. And um, it was, it's called the quack medicine machine now, but back then they were very serious about it. You would, it could run an x-ray tube, it could do these uh, different electrical treatments. These are pieces from textbooks back in the time. Uh, the guy on the bottom is having a bad day. They could cure anything from uh, loss of appetite, uh, you know, you name it, you could cure with 100,000 volts. <laughs> the last three lines, a skillfully directed spark. Uh, I also got this from him one time. This is a wow. x-ray control unit and a, and a tube and a stand from about 1913. Hmm. So we're looking around this place this time and uh, came up with a few meters and things that I like. Um, he had very good <coughs> things too. Um, but I guess I wasn't hitting his total what he needed. And he's scratching his head, what can we do? The place has a big entrance way, a staircase like in the Adams family. And um, we, we looked around the basement, didn't come up with anything. There's other rooms and closets we looked through. I finally said, wait, you like TV stuff too. There's something I have, and we go wandering up, there's this giant staircase just dead ends into a wall. <laughs> It's kind of spooky when you're going up there. The only light coming in was from uh, a really old window and a, and a flashlight he had. And he roots around this closet, and uh, and he comes up with the with this box and blows the dust off of it. And he says, "I've never heard of one of these things." I said, "No, I, I never have." And we we took it down and, and like I said, blew some dust off of it and started looking at it. Um, it's, it was all there, a kit from 1927 or 8 that was never put together. Uh, back when I started with it, the cellophane and all was in a lot better shape because it, as I've taken it apart for for pictures, it's it's gotten a little beat up on the sides of the box are starting to see some rough times. So later on you can look at anything you want, but try not to touch. It's, it's, it's having a rough time. But since I'd never heard of it, I was really just puzzled. What is it? Radio pictures from the 1920s. And I, I started to say I hadn't heard of that guy's name. But then the more I started to look into radio pictures, I found that there were a lot of things that were uh, you could read about. And it's, a lot of them start out on wire, with wire photos. This is called a ray photo. There's a Telegraphic photography, you can look up, telestereograph, Jenkins wireless photography, RCA photo radiograms, the Swinton system we'll talk about, and my favorite, Professor Korn's compensated selenium system. <laughs> also cures gallery thing. But this was what I found out about Professor Korn. He actually sent, that's a sample of a picture that, that he did in 1907 sent by wire, uh, telephone wire, from Paris to uh, London. And he had a, um, you know, operate on a phone, use selenium cells, a, a very high-intensity lamp called the Nernst lamp, a magnetic <laughs> shutter, and they would make a transparency, and that's what uh, they sent it from. And it had what, what you could call manual synchronization, because the reason he's on the phone there is he's telling him, send now so that he could start the machine. And that was the sink pulse, was him yelling, start now. <laughs> but the, uh, the system that he used, and this is a picture of uh, King Edward that was sent on November 7, 1907, was pretty simple. It, it would have N1 over there is, uh, is a lamp. Uh, the transparency uh, film would be on that cylinder. Uh, reflector inside to send the light to the selenium cell <coughs> there, which then responds to the uh, intensity of the light that passes through the transparency. And then on the other end, uh, so these two wires would have been what goes from there on the telephone to, into uh, from Paris to London. Um, they have a, a galvanometer with a sh that's actually actuating a shutter so that when a second lamp shines through, it'll expose the film on the other side. 
And the second selenium cell, I guess, is to reset the, uh, uh, the galvanometer. So this was a pretty good system. And, and the, the need would be for newspaper work, that kind of thing, that, that uh, you can send a picture with the news. Another type was this telestereograph by this man named Berlin. And what they made to, to make this work was with a relief photograph. They could have been made in uh, either in a uh, gelatin or a metal, like a tin foil kind of thing. And they were placed on a drum. And the high and lows, peaks and valleys would correspond to how bright or dark the original image was. And you can see it works a little seesaw there to uh, control with current going through a rheostat. And then they would get a corresponding amount of current, and then that could then produce an image on, on some kind of paper. When that same system was put all together, that's what it ended up looking like. So it was not quite as simple as a diagram, but you can see the lamp would have been up there, there's a cylinder, and then this, this was the part that reproduced the images. And he got some really nice quality images out of it. But then still we were only working with, with things by wire. Then um, Jenkins, who did so much work in, uh, in mechanical television, also started working in, uh, in electronic, uh, making pictures this way. And he was actually sending them out by radio. Uh, he took uh, some samples of his images. And uh, this is one that was sent by radio. Not to be outdone, RCA at the same time was, in time period, was working on something in 1924. And you can see how elaborate system the, uh, and they started, that was the first time they started calling it a fax that I, that I saw in the uh, records. And then uh, when you start to look at how this might have related to the ideas that eventually became television, this was a proposal by a man named Campbell Swinton. And what he has is based on two Crookes tubes. So a Crookes tube is basically a tube without a filament. It works on a very high voltage. And um, what he did here was he has a mosaic that, that the light comes and hits a screen that catches the electrons bouncing off the, the mosaic. And he's creating a beam. He needs 100,000 volts on a Crookes tube to, to get a beam. And then two uh, mechanical alternators, I guess you call them, that are, are generating uh, an alternating magnetic field to deflect the beam to, to follow that. So you're looking at basically something like a TV pickup tube. And on the receiving side, you propose the same setup uh, as a CRT with a screen and uh, deflection magnets and, uh, and the same deal with the cold cathode um, to produce an electron stream. So this was actually never built. It was only a proposal because the, the technology just wasn't there to, to really do that. But then, you know, what is this Cooley system? So. It had the book there, so I started looking through it, and it says definitely radio pictures at home. And 1928 was on there, but basically, you know, if, if your system was that complicated to send us a, a signal out, how is he proposing that we could do this at home? And uh, what he did was. They put this all out in articles in Radio Broadcast Magazine. If you have some of these at home, uh, those last four months of uh, 1927, they produced a series of articles about it. And, um, and it, the title of the first one in September was Radio Picture Reception for the Experiment. And they actually in-house in built the system at, uh, at Radio Broadcast. This is the, uh, the transmitter, which uh, has the usual bank of batteries for 1920s work, and a transmitter up there. And, and you can see uh, this would be a cylinder that would have the uh, original uh, photograph in it. And 
and a uh, compared to other stuff, a pretty simple receiver. Um, and then the, the actual uh, piece that would print the paper again. So you, you look at this and say, well, this is going to be a kit or, or a plan in a magazine. And, and you'd think that the talent might not be there to actually pull this off. But in the early 1920s, when most radios were home built anyway, there were a lot of talented experimenters, home, home uh, craftsmen that could actually do this stuff. And by 28, most of the radios were, were simpler factory built things. So the, the idea that those people were still out there that could do this stuff was pretty plausible. <coughs> So this man, Austin Cooley, that came up with this, joins the radio broadcast staff, and uh, and the articles begin and uh, seriously with the October issue. And he formed the Radio Vision Corp. Like um, like a lot of things, we see plans in old magazines. Someone started a little company for the people who would want the kit and, uh, and and help actually building this themselves. But then. If you build all this, what's the hook? What, what's going to make me want to go through all this expense and, and time and all to, uh, to actually do this? And they, the question would have to be, well, what will I see on this thing? And the, um, if, if you look at what things were popular on radio at the time, things like the prize fight, you can see the, they show a family here listening and uh, the broadcast team at the, uh, at the fight. But if you really look close at it, they're actually listening on the radio here, and they're looking at still pictures uh, on this imaginary to be built uh, unit at home. And at the transmitter at the uh, at the fight, they're putting still pictures up on the cylinder and uh, and sending them out with the uh, regular transmission. Now, who at home would be the one who could actually pull this off? Well, it would have to be mom and dad are just fascinated by it. But that clever high school kid, he can do it. <laughs> and uh, one of the things they proposed to save you some money was you'd use your own radio, and you would get the kit attachments and put them on a Victrola to, to actually turn the cylinder. And there, there was actually, they don't talk much about it because I, I assume there was a lot of grief you had to take this paper off the cylinder and actually run it through a photographic developer. Photo paper. So how many things you would see? Well, uh, maybe they were long programs. But here's a sample of, of images that they actually put in. I mean, it looked better when it's not just blown up, but these pictures were in radio broadcast. So I started puzzling the next step. Well, how, how does this all work? And... Um, in the, in the book there and in the articles, they did start to, to break it down so that you could see what's actually happening here. The, um, the basic blow up of it is that there's a motor turning a, a threaded shaft. Uh, the picture is mounted up on the drum. The motor drives uh, this disc interrupter, they call it, and the, and the drum. And the light is chopped by the disc. So basically, they're chopping up the light and through this prism and lens, focusing it right on the, uh, on the picture. And as the, uh, as the shaft turns, uh, the drum, for every turn, the drum goes down one eighth of an inch. So an image is uh, scanned 80 lines to an inch. And the light reflected off the picture is picked up by the, uh, the photo cell over there. And they gave block diagrams of uh, the whole system. It, it, it wasn't uh, very much bandwidth, so it was basically going through a, uh, the picture amplifier is just another audio amplifier stage, just as if it was a microphone. And, um, and then through the radio transmitter. Uh, they did have an oscillator that, that would put a, um, a sync pulse in that we talked about. And uh, this is another way out of it. So the, the complete system, right from the, uh, this is a simplified version of what we were just looking at, 
then on the receiver, they would have to use your home receiver, and their kit had a single stage amplifier, the oscillator, and uh, and then we'll see how, how that part of it works. What they were sending out uh, was an 800 hertz tone with uh, amplitude modulation in proportion to the light. So um, the sync burst would be 20 high output ones, and they would add a white strip to the uh, the scene between uh, as you make one turn as, as a signal for the end. And each time it would, the disc, the cylinder <coughs> turn, the sync signal would trigger the relay switch. So it would actually do one turn, one revolution and stop um, and wait for another pulse to, to get started again. So the way that the, uh, the number of holes in the disc interrupter and, and the number of lines per inch, you came up with a, uh, pixel, a picture that's 480 pixels by 480. This is a copy of the uh, patent he actually uh, was granted and uh, actually sometime after the article came out. So with the kit, they actually proposed a, uh, a layout for the um, all the components to build it. And um, mm -hmm. you could either use the phonograph uh, uh, controller as your motion for the uh, drum, or you, you could use a, I guess it must have been available cheap then, just little uh, spring motors from phonographs that you could build your own box and put it in. The um, Diagrams that I found on it, uh, the early diagram just had the two tubes. And you can see where they have you hooking into your radio here. They've, they've got a rheostat to uh, control the, the amount of signal. And uh, audio type transformer, an amplifier tube. And then it's, it's triggering that relay uh, depending on the, uh, the, the sync pulse to, to start a revolution. And what it actually did to print the um, on the paper was this next oscillator here that is basically running like a little Tesla coil. And the output of the coil would, would come over to the drum and it would produce a little arc through the paper to the to the drum, and that light from that arc is what exposed the, the paper. And then you can see they show the relay stopping it for each uh, revolution. They came up with a, a later diagram that had three tubes, because it, it looks like they separated off the control of the relay and the uh, and the, just the, the uh, signal to run the oscillator. And uh, and they're in their kit, we'll see if they have a, a transformer that they thought was the best thing for uh, modulating the signal. So building the kit, um, they. They didn't plan on giving you everything. You had still to be doing a lot of this stuff yourself. You got their uh, transformer, the, uh, the piece that goes on the phonograph, uh, and um, that's a coupler that we'll look at later. But you're expected on your own to supply a good receiver, a phonograph for a suitable motor, the tubes, <coughs> all the small components, a uh, cabinet, front panel, paper, everything. <laughs> And it was hundred bucks to still buy the kit. <laughs> so the, the recorder that's actually in the in the box there, um, we'll we'll take a look at. And I've actually I have a picture coming up that uh, I did just this. You can couple it to the phonograph motor and um, and set it up. This is it just hooked to a Victrola, so it's the, the coupler is down under there. This one, unfortunately, um, in the years of sitting in a box, uh, is made of pop metal, so you can imagine that the, uh, the shaft there doesn't actually turn. <coughs> so, uh, nothing to help that. That's the, uh, the coupler that hooks it to the uh, phone grip. And this... Um, this ID tag shows up on the uh, recorder itself. That uh, very wishful thinking serial number. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have started at uh, 10,000 feet. 
<laughs> Question for you. It's a holographic paper. This has to be done in the dark. Uh, the impression I got, they, they didn't make a lot of that up in their article, but that it might have been a slow enough paper that you could have it out long enough and then so, take it in. So once you've taken it out of its envelope or whatever it came in. Because I'm curious if this time. thing would fit underneath the cover of the controller and that would be black enough or dark enough. No, they didn't seem to, to think you had to do that. Really? Yeah. And this is the... Um, the uh, where the arc would actually go through it's, it's another picture a little better <coughs> looks just like a, uh, a steel phonograph needle because that's what would uh, send the arc through. and on the bottom is the um, is the relay that stops it for every revolution so it's it's very actually like a solenoid just the thing pops up and as it whips around <coughs> the, the shaft uh, gets caught so it's released. This, uh, but you can see the, uh, the usual uh, corrosion on pot metal ones. So I guess as part of their kit, they thought they had the best modulation transformer design. So they, that came with the kit, and um, in their in their ads, they said it has uh, represents years of experimentation to get the best uh, discharge from the coil. And this is the, the coil that actually makes the, uh, the high voltage for the arc. And um, their description, um, accurately calibrated, it's based on coil that's the best that money can buy. The, um, the little piece on it there um, is actually would have been a handy thing if you're wondering if your unit's working or not, or if you're setting it up. They call that the corona indicator. It's just a glass. You got a light? No, it's not even really. It's just two, uh, two con uh, conducting pieces in a piece of glass just to keep your hands off of it. <laughs> but it would just, if, if you're getting an arc, it would arc across there too. So, you know, uh, as, it, as it spreads out, I guess you were supposed to get used to the best spot to have the most amount of arc that it would because the amount of arc you get is basically going to be like a contrast on your picture. And they had it for, uh, for that too. They gave you the um, <clears throat> the whole layout, the blueprint to uh, cut your own front panel, and uh, and a layout just to put on a bottom panel to uh, mark all the holes and stuff for your parts. And if you wanted to get everything, you know, from them, right down to that practice record that's in the kit, you can buy things a la carte or in the, uh, in the big kit. And um, <clears throat> another company that I can't see where it might have been related to him, but a company in Brooklyn, Presto Machine, would actually make the uh, approved by Cooley uh, motor box for you to just crank it. So, assuming you went and did all of this, uh, testing the kit. So this is what they would expect you to have had uh, by the time you're ready to, to go. The radio receiver, looks like it might be a pulse group. Um, big speaker so that you could be hearing the show and being told when to turn to hook up your uh, picture receiver. The uh, image intensifier, which is the amplifier and the and the coil, and then the motor drive for the uh, for this uh, drum. So the way they they explain adjusting it is you they gave you a recommended signal gain throughout your receiver. Um, that there's an adjustment for the frequency of, of the oscillator that's running the coil, and then I guess it was a trial and error thing to set a good sync level for the trip magnet, otherwise you wouldn't be getting the lines. And they gave pictures of, um, you know, what what a misadjusted one. This one isn't isn't enough corona. Uh, where you're getting blind spots in the lines. <coughs> and since they weren't broadcasting all the time, they gave you the practice record. And um,
It sounds like an old fax machine. <laughs> I can't get the model of the fax machine. Yeah, and, you, and you hear a constant chirp, almost like a, a sonar, like a beep, beep, beep for every sync pulse that it comes through. So then, uh, once you've gotten practice with your, uh, with your record, then you're all ready to start looking in instead of listening in like all the other people were doing in the 1920s. This is the team on uh, every Wednesday night on WMCA out of New York, the Radio Visionaries. They were pretty scary looking. They had the director there, and I guess the, this would be a sample of the kind of picture they would send out at the beginning of the program. It took about six minutes for the picture part to go out, and then, uh, and then they would come on and and then you would listen to whatever these people were singing. Uh, some of the stations that ran the programming, uh, WMCA, uh, WOR was doing stuff with a different type of machine, I believe. Uh, WJR is another big one out of Detroit. And in Canada, there was a, a club form that picked people who, I guess, in the snow had nothing better to do than uh, try to get the best picture. <coughs> <coughs> but then uh, the company or Cooley couldn't avoid the fact that television was coming even though it was still uh, mechanical it would still be a far sight better if people were transmitting television than, than doing the still pictures so he started to adapt uh, some of his products to television he built what he thought was a much better uh, that would be where a neon type of neon tube that they built, but running it off the high voltage from that uh, corona unit. And um, it had a larger plate, inch and a half plate, inch and a half, and uh, 5,000 hour life. And he also proposed this thing that I, I can't believe could possibly work, where instead of having a neon tube or whatever, they would have a disc spinning and it would create little arcs around there that would light up and then be projected through to a viewing screen. Yeah. Uh, I can't find anything from the TV museum or anybody that, that sh saw, uh, this is the actual disc that they sold for that. Um, so instead of um, pinholes through the disc, there were these little tubes that come through. And each tube would have an arc happen behind it, and then the light would come through the tube and project it up on the screen. Um, nobody I know has ever seen one of these uh, discs in place. That's the uh, blow of the power went through to the screen. But even though um, Cooley and, and Radio Broadcast uh, didn't get to go much further with this product, it was only a few years before people like Crosley came out with a machine like the Rito, where they would uh, broadcast the newspaper to people um, at night. The, the big WLW uh, transmitter at 2 in the morning would switch to sending out pictures, and they would um, write this little newspaper, and over a couple hours it would, uh, it would fill up, and then in the morning, the rural farmer would be able to just go and pull the newspaper off the floor. And um, you can see they used something uh, like a printer, just a print head that, uh, that hits a special paper. And it had a timer so that you could set it for when uh, you were going to bring it on and when it would shut off. Um, this is one format that WOR in, uh, in New York did broadcast too. And here's the way the, um, you would go in, in the morning and then just, there was a Crosley radio that matched the Rito box. And you would just make a little tower of it, fill it with paper, and there you go. But the, uh, and then RCA finished their plans to make the home newspaper. And it was going to be a very similar idea with the uh, newspaper just being spit out in the front. But uh, the, the amount that it would cost to do this um, just never made it uh, feasible for people. Yeah, I was just curious to you know how much they were going to charge for the Crosley? Or? The Crosley, no, I, I, I could probably find that out. But uh, 
especially Val Crosley, his, his brother that worked for him and, and managed most things, you know, not only the flamboyant guy, uh, spent a lot of time as a farmer, though, and, and he really felt for the rural people who would, you know, only get their mail once a week or whatever if they went into town. Uh, they didn't have power, they didn't have much radio, and, and he was actually doing it before there was radio, so he, he knew the isolation they had. So they really were convinced that whatever it would cost to, to do this, that, that people would go for it, but it just didn't last very long. But um, NRCA found that out very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but more about our Mr. Cooley. You know, most of if you look at him up, a lot of the, he gets a lot of the credit for developing early fax machines, and uh, and the use really became newspapers. He went to work for uh, the New York Times and became their vice president of facsimile services. But. Um, Earlier on in 1935, he sent images. There was apparently a big crash of a Navy dirigible in, uh, in California, and he was able to get to the scene with one of his units to, to capture the pictures and send it out in wide world, wire photos. And the goal then was to produce a, a rugged portable that a reporter, just like now, they could take a cameraman with them, they could take a machine that would take a picture and they could send out the facsimile. And, um, it developed further in World War II. We worked on systems to send uh, weather maps to uh, soldiers in the field who could actually look at things and get a much better interpretation of what the weather might be doing if you're looking at a map as opposed to someone saying uh, just a few lines and then you've moved around and you don't know what the weather's going to be where you're going. And it did the same thing to, uh, to send weather maps and information to ships. So, <clears throat> His career really, you know, a long time, and this is what more of the, the more modern uh, <coughs> facsimile machines looked like for, uh, for wire photo work. And um, he lived a long life, 1900-1993, with uh, 75 patents related to uh, sending electronic images, and at least I had never even heard of this stuff. So that's, that's what I was able to find out. Uh, you guys are welcome to the to look at this, um, but again, like I said, it's, it's got really fragile, and uh, I'll open it up, but I can't take anything out, and uh, probably not a good idea to, to play with the uh, diagrams too much or the record. Okay. Any questions? Mike, have you seen one other than uh, one photograph? You've never seen one yet? I'm assuming most of the actual broadcast of all these pictures are long lost. Like they were probably never put to wire or tape or this. No, uh, but just but the demonstration record right. can uh, chirp its way back to uh, creating a picture somehow. If someone wanted to really disassemble it and. Uh, yeah. Do you have the record? Yeah. Oh. That corona wire would arc through the imaging paper to the drum? It was the, it was the drum that was drawing it. That would be grounded. Uh, whether it actually penetrated, I don't think it could have perforated it, but it just produced an arc right around the uh, around that tip. Hmm. They didn't use a wet surface, did they? No, it didn't say anything. <laughs> those pictures, did, are those actual pictures of your machine? Yeah. But you took it out. The yeah. Yeah. And that's that's when it got pretty deep now because the cell thing was sticking to the parts in the area. Oh, yeah. uh, it was a little rough trip. Did, I know this is a weird question. Do you have any idea how that survived? I mean, no. No idea. You know, <coughs> I, yeah, I picture someone getting it for Christmas and saying, what the hell did you buy this for? Yeah, it's a, it's a regular 78. Yeah, and, it, and he announces that, uh, you know, this is a test of the full medical <coughs> system starting now, and then it just beeps and changes. Oh, so you, you played it back and recorded it on your machine? <coughs> 
Yeah, and I just can't get it to play on, uh, on, on the computer here tonight. Have you tried converting it to a picture? No. I, like I said, if someone wanted to, to uh, maybe put the output on a scope and try to dissect what's going on. Or write a program. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> So it's it's supposed to be like like a test picture, a test pattern. Well, you know, it is, I don't know what the picture is on the record. So it's frequency shift key, test key. Uh, okay. So 800 per stone, and then just and then that burst that would be you know it's happening like every second. It's making that chirp, and it's stopping the motor, and then starting the motor. Yeah. Did the gentleman you purchased it from, did he give you a history of provenance of where he got it? Where he got it? No, he just had it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, well, he, he told me, I like this guy, so I'll just start from saying that. But he told me about uh, this big house. He's converted other parts of the house into apartments. And um, some of it's new construction, some of it's in the old construction. And he said he was going through a nasty divorce, so he didn't want a lot of his radios and things to go to his about to be ex-wife. So he went to one of the two-bedroom apartments, filled one of the bed that was empty, filled one of the bedrooms with all his radio stuff, and walled it in. <laughs> <laughs> I figure if I rent the place to someone who's only going to stay a year, the divorce will be over. I'll go. And uh, take the wall down. <coughs> so then he says, he just like, you know, don't you hate when this happens? You guys stayed 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hate when that happens. <laughs> so, I mean, I, this could have been in there for 11 years, too. Stills, so they're going to blow like 12 minutes out of an hour show. And it reminded me of what uh, CBS did in the early days of color television, where here they had a, you know, a, a format that wasn't compatible with black and white. So they would have to uh, take a programming time where they might have had a million viewers back in 51 or something, and shut them out because they couldn't watch it anymore, and the 200 people that had color televisions <laughs> enjoyed it. So they were doing, you know, they'd kill a radio station. They couldn't possibly make an economic model work for doing that. So I think that's probably the first thing that killed it. Yeah. And then the fact that uh, scanning disc televisions for people who are really fanatics about it were catching up. Demonstration this evening at the New Jersey Antique Radio Club. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, 
Oh, wow. Very good. good. We came up tops on that one. All right. Um, like I said, one week we have our repair clinic. If you're coming, let me know. You let me know now. A little while. Send me an email. Fine. Let me know what you're bringing. I'll dig up the schematic if you don't have it. Three weeks, guys. In three weeks, we've got a full repair clinic. All right? No. We're going to make a good no. show. What? In three weeks, we have a full swap meet. Yeah, two weeks. A full swap meeting, all right? And, um, you know, get your uh, reservations as soon as possible so we, we know how many people are coming. Uh, last fall, guys, it was the best fall show we ever had. I was dragging out tables from any place I could find, all right? So we're hoping to see that again, all right? This one. Can I make an early technology announcement? Because I think based on this, people may want to look at something that's coming in the upcoming Early month. technology Early announcement. Early technology announcement. Go ahead. In, on November 19th at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, George Williman, who is the, uh, uh, the head of the Nitrate Vaults at the Library of Congress, is going to be presenting a presentation on Edison's kinetophones. I don't know how many people realize this, but Edison was experimenting with sound movies in the 1912 era. And he developed a system called the kinetophone, which was an acoustically amplified sound system for movies. They'd have a, they'd have a, uh, like a Victrola out in the front of the theater, interconnected with a projector and a linen cable that ran the length of the theater, play these sound movies. And there are some kinetophones that you could see on, uh, on YouTube. If you type in kinetophone, you can see it there. But if you want to see George's presentation, plus some restored kinetophones that, he, that the Library of Congress has restored. I'll give you an example. On one restoration, they made a, they had the original Edison camera negative, and they, um, they made a 2K restoration from the negative, found the kinetophone cylinder, restored the sound, and if you see this sound photo, if you see this sound movie from 1913, it's absolutely incredible, because it looks like it was made yesterday. Hmm. It's 103 years old. And so on November 19th, I don't know the time of the program at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He's going to be doing a presentation and showing some of those kinetophones, most likely that one that I mentioned. Do you think that would be online? Yeah, I think you'll find out about online if you type in Museum of Modern no, Art. No, I, I mean the demonstration itself. Um, well, <laughs> on, on YouTube, they, he's uploaded, I think, one kinetophone. And there's, and there's a couple that are circulating out there on YouTube. And they're interesting to see. As a matter of fact, the, the the one that premiered the whole technology um, was a gentleman standing there and talking about what this technology is. And, and when you watch it, it's really ironic because he says, in a hundred years from now, people will be able to see the actors of today speaking like me. And you can. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's him. But, uh, and here we are on the later. But if, if you guys are interested in this early sound technology, um, what George has been doing on restoring these kinetophones in his presentation itself is really, really interesting. Oh, so. Thanks for the Didn't info. they have one of those at the Edison National Park? That's, That's a good park. question. That's I think I question. saw one. He, um, he tells me that the library has 11, uh, 11 films, eight of which are complete with sound. <laughs> and he said that uh, there's one film that they have called Vote for Women. And uh, basically, um, it was an early suffragette movie. And he said when they would show it in the theaters, uh, the men would boo. You know? <laughs> so, so it's, but it's a very historic film. And they have the film, but they don't have the sound. And I, I wrote an article on it for this for next month's uh, Classic Images, asking any collectors if, if you have a kinetophone bit, uh, film of it for that film, please tell the Library of Congress that they, they would really like to map the sound to the film to the sport for the, I think it's the anniversary of the 19th Amendment coming across the next year is getting women the right to vote. As a matter of fact, they're so interested in trying to restore this that he said they were going to hire lip readers to see what the people were saying and see if they could dub in a soundtrack because they're so interested in restoring this one particular film. But, All right, anyway. great. Thanks, Bob, for that info. Um, our next meeting is uh, November 11th. That show and tell, and that'll be at InfoAge. Right, so our next meeting is after our full swap. Right? So again, get your reservation early. Uh, plan on vending. If you're going to vend, let me know. And uh, we'll have another successful full swap. We really appreciate it. All right, thanks for coming. And again, we've got to thank Mike Molnar. <laughs> Thank you.
Is that a cricket? What's that? Is that a cricket? It's amazing. We get to see one of them. Probably there's no more of those around. Yeah, it's a good one. 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 Yeah, it's a good one.